The night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go Beyond Reality. Good evening, good morning, and welcome. It's Beyond Reality Radio. I'm your host, J.V. Johnson. Jason has the night off. We have a great show for you tonight. Uh, I've been promoting all week that we've got Gloria York on, who is the best-selling author of a book called Medical Manslaughter. Your doctor will call... Will your doctor cause your death? And we're going to be talking to her um, and a little bit later in the program because uh, with the recent events in Paris and the tragic fire that claimed much of the Notre Dame Cathedral uh, and cost the world some very, very precious uh, works of art, including the structure itself. Um, there's been talk about a connection between that fire and some of Nostradamus's predictions. And we tried to get someone on last night to talk about that, and the best we could do was get somebody on tonight, given how uh, in demand that topic was for the moment. So we've uh, been treated to have John Hoag, who is a an international expert on Nostrad- Nostradamus, and um, he's actually a, a, a predict a prediction maker himself. He is a seer, and and uh, he's going to join us in the first segment after the break here and talk about the connection between the Notre Dame fire and Nostradamus's predictions. So we're re- really, really excited to have that. Um, and then Gloria York will be with us after that, after the bottom of the hour break to join us and talk about her book, medical manslaughter. Will your doctor cause your death? That's going to be a great discussion as well. And by the way, I didn't realize this when we had been talking about it earlier, but Gloria is also a, a medium. And uh, if we have time, she'll be taking some phone calls later in the show. If people want to, uh, make an effort to reach somebody on the other side and get some questions answered or uh, just make contact. Again, that'll be if we have time because we've got a jam-packed show tonight. Tomorrow, John Barber will be with us. We'll be talking about the Garrison tapes, never-before-seen documents provided by James Garrison on the JFK assassination. John's been releasing them on his YouTube channel, and we'll talk about that on tomorrow night's show. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Stay tuned. We've got a lot ahead. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. Most of you, I would just expect all of you are aware of the tragic events in Paris over the last 48 hours, uh, a magnificent structure, whether you're religious or not. The uh, cathedral at Notre, Notre Dame has been not only a, a, a home for uh, re- religious pilgrimage, but it's also been a work of art and contains or contained a tremendous number of priceless, irreplaceable works of art. And it burned uh, tragically in a fire that is still under investigation. Um, I'm hoping we get some answers soon. And I know that thankfully some of the relevant and artifacts and artwork were saved, and I think there's still an assessment being done as to what was lost. But either way, since that fire occurred, there has been talk about Nostradamus. Now, many of you know that name, of course, and uh, many of you know that he was a seer, a prophet of sorts, and uh, predicted many, many things. And there are very few people in the world that know Nostradamus as well as our next guest. John Hoag has been studying and writing about Nostradamus Nostradamus for many, many years. And John has agreed to uh, what what has turned out to be a very, very busy schedule. Interrupt that to join us for just a quick segment here. John, thank you for taking the time out to chat with us. It's a real pleasure to have you on. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Things usually get pretty hot when with me when something like this big uh, that's related to the namesake of the great prophet Notre Dame, uh, same in old French. Uh, it's uh, definitely uh, it is a question that even I'm writing several articles and and reviewing other astrologers who have made some pretty surprising commentary that, uh, frankly, I find is it, a bit of reaching straws. But uh, which often happens at this time, yeah. just like what happened in nine one one when uh, somebody took a couple real real Nostradamus verses about. The, the hollow mountains collapsing and all that, and then added the city of York, and uh, then posted it uh, right after the attack on nine one one. And when that happened, I was getting twenty thousand hits a second. Wow! So, <laughs> well, but I, it, but I had to explain to them that uh, this that this was a man who had made partial fraud on Nostradamus, which shadows Nostradamus all these uh, four hundred sixty four years. Um. Uh, because of the 
nature of his prophecies that you really got to know your 16th century French and and how people thought in the 16th century rather than do what we all easily do is fall into the mm-hmm. conceit of thinking Nostradamus is only talking about our times and our problems. Right. Um, you've graciously agreed to come back on the program uh, soon to uh, be with us for the entire show. Tonight we only have you for a few minutes, so let's jump right into what uh, happened in Paris and and how it may or may not connect to what Nostradamus uh, had predicted. Well, first, first thing I would say is that uh, to this point, even though there's there's been people astrologers like one in the United Kingdom um, uh, that has uh, made an article about uh, Quatrain Fifty One of Century or Volume uh, One being about this, and you've probably heard it bandied about. I mean, this is another one. This is, this is a true prophecy, but her translations is bad. I contend. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she's trusting in an author, so she's clearly not able to do this herself, uh, translate it. So I've, I'm writing an article, which will be out in hoagprophecy.com in, in about 24 hours, that uh, looks at the head of Aries, Jupiter, and Saturn. God eternal, what mutations, what what trans changes uh, is what he's saying. Um then the bad times return after a long century, that turmoil, and what turmoil in France and Italy. Now, I think what she's done is she's caught up on the whole, the conceit of the present time bias is like France and Italy is in a lot of trouble now. Um, but in so doing, uh, the head of Aries means the constellation of the sign of Aries in the old French. Uh, now, this person contends that it was exactly timed uh, his prediction, this prediction for the fire, but there's no reference at all that indicates uh, it's a burning church, unlike the very famous prophecy and actually the only prophecy that comes even close to describing a burning church, and that's uh, century 51, uh, sorry, a uh, century two of uh, volume two, uh, quatrain 51 is the famous uh, 1666 fire, where London is actually mentioned, the cathedral or the great lady. Uh, that's what people in the 16th century used to use as slang when they were talking about cathedrals, just like Our Lady, Notre Dame. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, he said, the blood of the just will be demanded of London. And he spells it out outright, and this is uh, a century and a half after he died, burnt by lightning fire in 23 the sixes. Now, that is actually a, a 320s, 60s, the sixes, which is uh, his odd way of saying 1666, because what he then talks about is the ancient lady, in this case the ancient church, will fall from the high place and many of the same sect will be killed. Well, when the fires of London were raging, in 1666, thousands of people thronged inside St. Paul's Cathedral, what is modern-day East London, and the leaden, uh, the leaden roof collapsed on them from the fire. Wow. So, so that's one of his chilling and more famous prophecies. Now, I have been going around trying, and I'm still going around if I find anything, but I... He, it is so easy with Nostradamus to be caught unconsciously in your own projections of what you want to find. Even if you're a skilled astrologer like this lady, uh, she's run into the trap uh, of doing this, and and uh, and she's a well-known astrologer in England. Um, it, it, Jessica Adams is her name, and so I'm doing a review of her her article that's kind of had a, a hit around the world, like. Like what I did in nine one one, trying to answer the question of this thing not being actually translated right. But you know, he does definitely see things. But the thing is, the head of Aries, uh, what she's done is completely left out uh, Jupiter and Saturn. That if Jupiter and Saturn are put together inside the sign of Aries, she is uh, he Nostradamus is talking about Jupiter Saturn conjunction in Aries, which is very rare. It's only it happened at the beginning of World War Two. So it could be applied to that, the mm-hmm. bad times of World War, Second World War come. Or it, it also happened just prior 
1999, just prior to the millennium. And it's about a long century ending. Now, many a historian will tell you that there's been so much history packed into the 20th century that it it, if you could match it, you'd have to look at it, all the changes of history in the previous 19 centuries to match what was going on in the 20th century. So it's long, because Nostradamus is a poet, it's long in regards to the poetic uh, descriptions, metaphorical, long because, oh God, you know, it's like when time's terrible, it runs long, and, and there was a lot of terrible stuff happening in the 20th century, in his view, I, t- I contend. So it's it's basically, and what's shocking is I had forgotten I wrote this uh, many years ago, so I'm going to quote it um, right here. Uh, the way I understood this to mean is the, the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aries takes place only twice. This is 1995 I wrote this, only twice in the 20th century. 21st December 1939 through 21st March 1940. And again, at 14 February through 2nd March 1999. The dating implies that bad times, as he calls it, similar to those of World War II, return, as he says, uh, uh, again at the end of this century, like it did with World War II. With the new millennium uh, comes the new challenge of an exploding birth rate and plummeting food and water reserves, added to uncertain ecological consequences of global warming. If 1999 does not see a dramatic global resolve to change ourselves and tackle new problems, Armageddon may yet visit us in the 2020s and 2030s. I'd forgotten that I wow. wrote that. And uh, usually I write things and forget, and that's why I document everything. So I was like, this morning, looking at this, and oh my God, that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah. So um, I know we don't have a lot of time with you. Um, if you had to sum up the, the connection from what happened in Paris to what you've been studying and what you're trying to analyze. Is there a connection here directly, or do you still have work to do? Well, I still, I, I'm always at work and always opening myself to seeing it in a new way. Um, so easy for Nostradamus scholars to get doctrinal about this. Right. I'm never that way, and I suppose that's why I'm, I have staying power since 1983. I've been doing this. I'm the only one that's been done it this long. Um, and, and it's because I adapt to realities. Now, what I'm, I'm, I'm not yet certain, maybe by the time we do the show, um, the full show, I may be more certain, but what I'm, what I'm seeing here is that I can pretty sure say that I am, unless something really leaps out, that there is nothing directly about this fire. But in a general term of things, the, the times of troubles that would see such a fire, yeah. we're already in. Yeah. And he, he has stated that. Uh, and it's not so much in, I mean, it's certainly symbolic what's happening to, to Paris, and it's important because Nostradamus views the future through the French people of the future. So it's very important whatever France is going through or is involved in. So So I will keep on it, but I think a lot of people who are currently um, correlating this fire to Nostradamus are doing so as with a rather amateurish unawareness of the traps and a knowledge of 16th century uh, mindsets in French. Now you, um, last question here, you also have made some predictions and uh, are routinely uh, looking into the future. Does Does this line up with anything that you've seen? Well, um, in an indirect way, one of the things that it's just an episode in a larger picture in Nostradamus and in my own things is is this mistranslation of a Muslim invasion of Europe. Now, there have been some people that even had maneuvers, chapter and verse, uh, all the way to London and into France. But I think this is the thing that's important with Nostradamus. He, he was an Islamophobe. But he had reasons, because Provence was constantly being terrorized by the Islamic terrorists of that time, the Barbary Corsairs. So I often find that people of any time, if they're looking in the future, will use the metaphors of their time. So he uses those metaphors, I think, uh, to look at 
Islamic terrorism. Um, and there are certainly some, especially with Syria, especially with the issue of how somebody called the Barbare, like Barbary, as in Barbary Coast Corsairs, the Barbare in French anagram is of or from the Arab and uh, to translate it, and it's a Babari vassal, and he talks about the great eagle kings of the north that tried to make peace in 89, 1989, and uh, they are undermined by a Babari vassal. Now, now when you look at what's going on with Iran, they're not Arabs, but uh, but with the um, their allies, Hezbollah and Syria, and the way America and Russia are kind of being moved like moths into the fire of the Syrian revol- uh, civil war and other places, it seems to me that the flashpoint that could escalate suddenly into a full-scale confrontation between Russia and America is related to the events in Syria and the Middle East. John, uh, thank you for joining us on such short notice and um, helping us out with this. I really do look forward to having you back for an entire program because in just a few minutes we've uh, spoken here, you've uh, you've you've laid out so much that has cr- created so much um, curiosity in my mind that we really do have to spend more time with it. It'll be a fast two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it certainly will. All right, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Don't forget uh, John's website is hoge, H-O-G-U-E, prophecy.com. A lot of great information there. Uh, Visit the website. And we will have John back to have a full program with us because it's a fascinating topic. Even if we're just talking about Nostradamus himself, uh, John is a preeminent uh, researcher and interpreter of Nostradamus' work. So we'll do that. Um, Coming up in just a few minutes, we'll have our uh, next guest on, Gloria York, best-selling author of Medical Manslaughter, Will Your Doctor Cause Your Death? Gloria is also a medium, and if we have time later in the show, we'll take your phone calls uh, to maybe try to connect to someone on the other side through Gloria. That's something we're, we're going to try to do if we have time. We'll also take your phone calls for questions, all at 844-687-7669. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Johaw. That's J-O-H-A-W. John Hogue uh, is a Nostradamus expert, and the story that has been circulating now that there is a connection between Nostradamus's predictions and what happened in Paris, it's disputed, it's a bit controversial. John uh, had an opinion, and he mentioned uh, another person uh, who's actually quite well known, Jessica Adams, and we're actually working on bringing her onto the program as well, so hopefully we'll be successful in doing that. But as promised, our guest for the evening is Gloria York. Gloria is the best-selling author of a book called Medical Manslaughter, Will Your Doctor Cause Your Death? This is a true story based on her husband's death by medical error. We all face the medical system at one point or another, whether it's for ourselves or for a parent or a child or another loved one in some fashion. And, um, you know, it can be a great experience, but it can also be a very challenging experience experience. And in the case of Gloria, it can be a very devastating experience. So Gloria is going to outline uh, supernatural experiences that took place, also miracles that took place. So we're very excited to have Gloria with us. Gloria, welcome to Beyond Reality Radio. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. So um, we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Um, I I don't know quite where to start, but let's... um, I want to know a little bit more about you, because in addition to having written this book, which will be the bulk of our conversation tonight, you're also an empath, a tarot card reader. I mean, you've, you've got some sensitivities. How long have you been aware of these sensitivities, and did they affect this process at all when you were going through this uh, with your husband? I've been a spiritual channeler since, uh, since childhood and have always received messages from the spirits, and as I have grown also, these powers and gifts have grown also. And um, so, yes, uh, channeling has been a big part of my life throughout. And whenever anyone would pass, a friend or a relative, the Spirit would come to me most of the time in the middle of the night and say they have a message that they wanted to relate to a relative. Um, 
I quickly learned <laughs> that you just don't say no to the spirit. When, when they want to give a message, it could be 2 o'clock in the morning, and I have said to them, you know, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Could, could, we, could we talk in the morning, maybe 10 or 11? I'm, I'm sleeping. And you try to go back to sleep, and they, they're insistent. Please, I have a message. Please, I want you to deliver a message. And so you have to take care of it at that time, no matter what time of the day that they approach you. So you're telling me that the these spirits uh, who want to or need to get a message to someone will wake you up in the middle of the night, if necessary, to deliver this message? Oh, yes, yeah, several wow. times. Wow. Several times. Yeah, it's 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 uh, quite phenomenal. I know it's difficult for a lot of people to even understand, but uh, I have done messages. Uh, sometimes they end up being six to ten pages typewritten, and uh, I'll go to a person's funeral at the end. Uh, I usually have it in an envelope, and I'm going to the family member, be it the daughter or son or or spouse, and I just simply say to them, I know this is going to be difficult for you to understand, but I am a spiritual channeler, and I am open to receiving messages from those that pass over. And your father or husband or whatever has given me a message for you. So it's in this envelope, so later on, today, tomorrow, whenever, you're alone this is their message to you. They have something they want you to know. When, and then I give them a hug, and mm-hmm. I offer again my condolences, and that's the end of that. How often does that happen to you? Is it really, really common, or is it in, in, in rare instances? No, it's very common. Really? Very common. How, yeah. do, the, how do the messages and or spirits come to you? Is it, is it in a dreamlike state, or is, are they there in a, in a physical form in some fashion? You know, it, they they come while I'm awake, okay, while I'm awake, mm-hmm. and it's amazing how not only can I hear them, but I can feel what they're feeling. In other words, if they start to cry, I can right away sense that they're crying, or they're throwing their hands in the air, or they're angry, or they're pounding on the table, or they're pacing while they're talking to me. I I sincerely can feel them, and um, in some cases, they even materialize. Has that ever been frightening to you? No, they don't frighten me. Mm -mm. They, They just, they honestly don't. Um, I imagine that in many cases there's a lot of emotion with those messages. Uh, how do the people that you deliver the messages to react? They're, they're really shocked because um, I have not promoted myself as a spiritual channeler, as some people do. They, they place an ad or put out a sign or it become well-known. The way it has worked with me is spirit has sent me to the person rather than having the people come to me. So um, many a times I'm going through my normal day and all of a sudden as I'm driving around do- doing errands, it'll come into my mind, stop at that jewel. And I then say, I don't have anything to get. I don't need anything. But then the message comes back again, stop at that jewel. So there's that jewel supermarket that Spirit wants me to stop at. And so it it's, comes on so strong and repeats, and so I, I eventually pull in, and I walk into the store, and I have my cart, and I'm walking through, and um, not, not knowing who I'm going to meet. But sure enough, I will either get into conversation with someone in a particular aisle or as we're waiting to check out, uh, all of a sudden, the person in front of me might turn, and we start a conversation, and the next thing I know, the person is telling me that their daughter is ill, or their daughter has passed, or their husband has passed, or something is going on there. And so, then spirit talks through me to them, especially if the person is deceased, and then I start saying to them, you know, even though they've passed, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that they're gone. They're still watching over you, and you you have to know that. And I talk to them that way because Spirit has given me the words. And usually the person ends up saying, I'm, I'm so glad I met you. I'm so glad we had this conversation. This has been so enlightening to me. And, I mean, sometimes it ends up with them in tears and, of course, a hug. And then they leave the store and go their way, and I go my way, and I know that I've accomplished what Spirit wanted me to do. Gloria, we, um, we've got a lot to talk about when it comes to your book, and I'm not sure where to start, but I think the best place to start, and I don't know, um, you know, I know a lot of this is going to be emotional for you and maybe even difficult for you, but we, will you tell us what happened with your husband? Yes, I wrote Medical Manslaughter because my husband died six years ago due to an egotistical doctor making a a very crucial mistake. She completely ignored me and my my thoughts uh, as the wife and power of attorney for him. Um, He fell at the house. He hit his head several times and uh, had severe blood all over his brain and in his brain. He was rushed to the hospital. A CAT scan showed all that. And then they said, we have to transport him to a larger hospital that has a neurological department. So they got him into intensive care, and he was there for three days, and the blood just started to go back into his body. Now, all this time, he had his senses about him. He didn't have any brain damage. He just had severe, severe head pain that he would just scream out that, gee, I've never had pain like this in my life. And so, of course, they were giving him Norco for that. So the doctor, after the third day, said, you know, you need to get up. And he wanted to get up. He's very anxious to get up and get well and get home, you know, very, very anxious. So the doctor said, yes, you need to get up. So we're going to send you up to a regular floor. You'll have rehab for about three days, and then you're going to go home. It's going to all work out great. And so up to the regular floor we went. Rehab had come in that morning and evaluated him, touch your nose, do this, do that. And they said, oh, great, we'll pick you up tomorrow morning. And again, you'll be home in a couple days. He fell asleep. In walks the doctor. She said, I've assumed his chart. I'm going to change all his medicines. And tonight I'm going to give him a sleeping pill. And I said, a sleeping pill, doctor? I said, is that his chart in your hand? She said, yes. I said, did you read it? Because if you read it, you see he's got blood all over his brain, even inside his brain. And I I don't think you want to give him a sleeping pill. I mean, I'm not in the medical field, but I've always read that you didn't want someone to really, you didn't want to push someone with a concussion to go into a deeper sleep. Oh, she said, oh, no, no. And she said, uh He needs that rest. He's going to have rehab. I want him to be rested. And back and forth we went. I was not given up on that. And she, so then she got belligerent. She said, I know what I'm doing. And she stormed out of the room. Well, I prayed on it, you know, as I pray on everything, talked to the Blessed Mother about it. Then I talked to my sister and some neighbors, friends. Everybody came up with the same answer. Well, it doesn't sound right, but she is a doctor. And so as the nurses would come in during the day to take the blood pressure or whatever, I was saying to them, listen, the doctor mentioned a sleeping pill tonight. I don't want him to have it. And, okay, well, I'll tell his nurse. I'll tell his nurse. So it got to be about 7 o'clock. He doesn't normally get his pills till 10. And so I... My husband was sleeping, and he'd wake up and sleep and wake up. And so finally around 7, 7.30, I said to him, you know, honey, I'm going to go. I've been here all day. I'm going to come back early tomorrow morning. You're going to go to rehab, and then you'll be home in a couple of days. And he was very happy about that. We both were. So the reason I wanted to leave that early was because I wanted to go back to find the nurse of the evening and specifically say again, no sleeping pill. So I went to look for them. They were, no one was on the floor. 
No one was at the nurse's station. And then I went to every single room on the floor looking for a nurse. And there was not one to be found. They all went to dinner at one time. They were gone. Wow. So I thought, okay, I, I'm going to go home. It's only a half hour's drive. I have plenty of time to tell them. And so I went home. As I was walking in the door, the phone was ringing. And it was my husband just checking to see if I got home okay. And I said, how'd you dial this phone? And he said, oh, the nurse is here. She dialed this for me. I said, oh, fantastic. Put her on. I need to talk to her. So I said, listen, the doctor mentioned today a sleeping pill. I, as his wife, absolutely positively don't want him to have that. And she said, well, too late. I already gave it to him. And I just shook all over. And I said, no, no, he doesn't get his pills to 10 o'clock. It's only 8 o'clock. She goes, I know, but tonight I decided to give it to him early because I want him to have a good night's sleep. Well, I knew this was, this was a major mistake. I could feel it. Couldn't sleep all night, ran in there the next morning, about 7.30, 8 o'clock, and I couldn't get him to wake up. I'm slapping his face. I'm calling his name. I'm saying I'm here. I'm making all kind of noise. I got some cold water, put it on his face. I lift his eyes, and then I got hysterical. I ran down the hall and just was yelling, what have you done to my husband? And, of course, the nurse at the end of the hall said, I haven't done anything to him. She says, I went to give him his pills this morning at 5, and he wouldn't wake up. So I figure he's in a deep sleep. I'll give him his pills later. And I said, he's not in a deep sleep. We've got a major problem. Get that doctor up here. And so she saw I was frantic. She wanted to know what was going on. I said, I don't have time to explain to you. Get her up here. We have an emergency. So um, anyway, she paged her and everything, and uh, the doctor didn't come, but then the head of rehab walked in saying, I'm here to get him. And I said, no, look, look what's happened. And um, so she couldn't believe it. She tried to get him to wake up. She looked at me. Oh, she shook her head. She said, I'm going to call the doctor. I said, yes, get her because the nurse can't seem to find her. And uh, she went to call her. And I said, no, I want a CAT scan. I want a CAT scan right today, now. And um, so when they came to get him for the CAT scan, the doctor had still not come up. We went downstairs, and when our elevator opened, all the other elevators opened too. And out walks this doctor, and she looked shocked to see us standing there. And she goes, oh, oh, uh, hi. I said, hi? I said, you know, I brought my husband in here. I said, alive and well, just with a problem from falling. And I said, look what you've done. I said, you've put him in a vegetable state. Well, all these elevators had opened up, and everybody was standing there. Nobody would move. Everybody was hearing this. And I wanted them to hear this. And she goes, oh, he'll be okay. He'll be okay. Uh, uh, He's just sleeping. He'll wake up tomorrow. He'll wake up tomorrow. And I put my finger in her face, and I said, he better wake up tomorrow, or I'll own this hospital. And so I said to the guys, come on, let's get this CAT scan done. Well, of course, he didn't wake up. And after two weeks, he didn't wake up, and the head neurology Uh, All of them were there working on it, trying to get him, trying all kind of tests. And after two weeks, when they couldn't get him to wake up, he came in, he showed me the tests. He goes, I don't know. He said, I'm really stymied. I'm I'm showing you x-rays in all of his brain. He should have woken up by now. I don't even know why he went into this coma. I said, I know why he went into it. He went into it because he was given a sleeping pill he should never have been given. But anyway, he said, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing more we could do. I said, well, what are we going to do now? I mean, he goes, let him die. (sighs) I said, let him die? I said, well, apparently, doctor, you never loved anyone. 
He said, I have, but I knew when to let them go. And he's lived a great life. Let him go. Let him go. He'll never come out of that coma. And if he does, he'll have such brain damage, he'll, he'll, he won't know you, he won't know how to speak. No, let him die. And see, my husband was a Chicago legend. He was, um, had a big band orchestra. He was an entertainer, a singer, he was a virtuoso of the saxophone. And, and so he, he was very well known in the Chicago area. And he also was a general manager of one of the largest hotels on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And, but his music career with his orchestra, he backed Frank Sinatra, Dean, Sammy, Tony Bennett, wow. Johnny Cash, Wayne Newton. I mean, the list became endless. Phyllis Diller. I mean, he, he set up shows uh, all the time and throughout the United States, and he did big, huge convention shows. In addition, like I said, he was a general manager of Thousand Room Hotel. And so he took very good care of himself. I mean, he would see his doctor at least once a month. I Gloria, mean, I'm sorry. I've just, I'm sorry. I've got, just, I'm sorry. I've got to cut you off right there because we have to go to break. We went long. We'll continue this conversation in just a few moments. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Looking for our guest's book? Go to Amazon.com slash shop slash JVJ Taps. We started out the show. We had John Hogan to talk about the connection between Nostradamus prophecy and the Notre Dame fire in Paris. And then um, we picked up with our next guest, Gloria York. And Gloria has written a book that's called Medical Manslaughter, Will Your Doctor Cause Your Death? And in the prior hour, and if, you, if you're just joining, you're going to want to re-listen to this program um, to hear Gloria's story of what happened with her and her husband in a hospital, which resulted in his death. And we had to cut her off because we just went long. We had breaks to fit into uh, the show. But I want to pick it up where we left off. And Gloria, you were telling us that your husband was a bit of a legend uh, in the Chicago area, um, associated with very many very, very famous people. Uh, he was also a general manager of a very large hotel. He was a bit of an institution in Chicago. Tell us, um, and you said he took care of himself. So pick up the story there because uh, our audience is riveted in, in what you're saying here. Okay. Um, in medical manslaughter, you know, there's been several books written about malpractice. But medical manslaughter is the first book of its kind. Because not only does it tell you the story of, of what happened, the true story of what happened, the only thing I changed in the books, was, which makes it fiction, is the fact that I had to change the names of the doctors, the hospital, the nursing home, uh, all those. Otherwise, the publisher wasn't going to print it, right, naturally, yeah, let me, because let me, worried let me, about legal ramifications. Yeah, let me stop so, you right there, um, Gloria. But the entire story <laughs> is true, and yeah. so... Not only will the reader or the listener uh, learn what happened, it's a superabundance of information that will teach you how to save your own life. So you will learn in medical manslaughter um, how to be a superior advocate, not only for the person in the bed, the loved one, but also for yourself as the person in the bed. It gives you tips on how to bring someone out of a coma, which, of course, I did. I brought my husband out of a coma after 34 days, even though they said that would never happen. Okay. Well, uh, Gloria, I, I'll, I, I'll go into yeah, like, I need, I need specifics to... in that, but I, I just <sighs> wanted to give you these highlights uh, right here in the, in the middle of the story so that people will understand what they will be reading and what they will learn from this book. Um, and again, uh, I take you into the nursing home and show you what a nightmare that is and can be. And then medical manslaughter intertwines beautifully spiritually. There were six miracles that occurred throughout this seven-month period, six miracles. And whether you're Catholic or not, it doesn't matter, because I, I even include a never-found-to-fail prayer to the Blessed Mother. And again, if you're Catholic or not, it doesn't matter. The Blessed Mother loves everyone and is everyone's Heavenly Mother, and this prayer works. And then finally, um, in medical manslaughter, you are, it is proven to you that there is life after death. Believe in the supernatural and believe in the afterlife because your deceased are not gone. 
Gloria, I've got to ask you a couple of questions here because um, you gave us a lot of information. The uh, book itself, because it's called a novel, and I was going to ask you about that, but what you're saying here is that the only reason it may be considered fiction is because you had to change some names involved. Is that right? That's correct. But the story itself uh, outlines and details what you went through, and it offer, uh, also offers people guidance on how to avoid what you went through. Absolutely. Now, um, I have to, I'm a little unsure about the outcome of your story. Your husband was in a coma. Uh, um, the doctors couldn't figure out why. You knew it was because of this sleeping pill that he was given. Did you lose your husband at that point? What happened? Okay. Um, then after they said they couldn't do any more for him, they, they started to pressure me to discharge him. And I said, where am I going to take him? So I ran around to all the different nursing homes, and no one would take him because he was in a coma. But finally, I met this one woman who uh, was in hospice, and she saw, you know, how frantic I was and that I really didn't want my husband to leave that hospital. I had no place to take him. So she knew a doctor at the hospital that was a medical director at this particular one nursing home that I really wanted him to be admitted to because it was renovated, it was beautiful, it was clean, and I was very particular about where he was going to go. And so she called him. He said, send over the records. I'll let her know in an hour. Well, within an hour, he accepted him. So we moved him over to this very nice nursing home. And I was so, so thankful and so anxious to meet him. And finally, about three, four days later in the evening, he, he stepped in. And I was thanking him like crazy, you know, oh, thank you. And he looked at me and he said, I only took him in because I expect him to die in five days. Oh. And I said, well, doctor, I'm going to bring him out of this coma. I said, I'm telling you that right now. I have more faith than you do. And he said, well, I'm here every few days. Let me know how that's working out. Well, I started a routine. Naturally, I looked into, you know, medically about comas and all, but I had to use my own intuition. And that's something that I lay on in the book. Use your intuition. Follow your gut, what your mind is telling you. Okay, because that's that's your alarm button that God gave you. And so I looked into it, and I started a routine. Naturally, I played his CDs constantly because that was him singing, and I wanted him to hear himself singing again. I wanted him to hear his orchestra and all. And even I got permission from the supervisor of the nursing home uh, if it would be okay if the CD could play constantly through the night. And he said, yes, I, of course, kept it, you know, low. But still, the other patrons around could hear it because it's in the dead of night. And they loved it because they were all seniors. And what we were playing there was the big band orchestra-type music. Right. And so they all loved it. Everyone was happy, and my husband got to hear it. And I'd come in in the morning, and I'd, I'd stop the CD. And then uh, I did other things during the day, and I read to him and got baby books and everything. So I relived stories and that for him. And 34 days later, he woke up wow. out of the coma. And the young CNA was just ready to give him a bed bath. And when she turned around, there he was with his eyes open looking at her. Wow. She got so excited, she dropped the pan of water, went running out, running down the hall, yelling, well, Mr. I'll use the names in the book, Mr. Carcioni's awake, he's awake, he's awake. The supervisor comes running. My husband is laying there looking at him, and he said, oh, hi, uh, we've been waiting for you to wake up. Your, your wife is here every day, all day long. Oh, my, how are you? And my husband looked at him and said, okay. And, of course, he was looking at him kind of frightened. He didn't know who this guy was. He didn't know where he was and all. So all he said was, okay. And then he fell back to sleep. So when I came walking into the nursing home, they, he woke up, he woke up. And, of course, I went running. Right. And here he's back in the coma. 
And I thought, oh, my. So I had to wait another two weeks. And finally, I was talking to him without looking at him. I was fixing the uh, air conditioner, trying to make it so it wouldn't be blown right on him. And I said, oh, I was talking out loud. And I said, all I want to hear from you is I want to hear you tell me you love me again. Mm -hmm. So I want you to wake up, and that's what I want to hear, that you love me again. And all of a sudden, I heard, uh... And I turned and I looked, and he, his eyes were open. He's looking at me. And I said, tell me you love me. Yeah. And so his speech now, now that he woke up the second time now, his speech is all garbled. Oh. And I said, oh, my. I said, and then he got all excited. Ah, you know, trying to say, yeah. where am I? Right. What's going on? What's happening? You know, you could just, he was frantic. Right. So I calmed him down. I hugged him, kissed him. And I said, okay, I'm having a hard time understanding you, but I'm going to just tell you what's going on so that you could just relax. So I said, you've been ill, but you're getting better now. And you're in a very nice place, and they really like you a lot, and they're helping you, and they're good people. And the good news is you're getting better. Soon you'll be home. And so don't worry about anything. Just relax. You're getting better. You'll be home in a few days. Now, I know that was a stretch, but anyway, that calmed him down. Then I went out found the supervisor of the, of the nursing home, and I said, could, could you get me a speech therapist? I said, his, his, you know, his speech is all garbled. He said, I know. He said, you know, we, we still don't know how much brain damage he has. He's been in a coma 34 days, Gloria. I said, I know. So he said, yeah, let me get you a speech therapist a couple of days. So she came in, and she would start to work with him. And when she wasn't there, um, I went and I bought baby books, and I was reading him, showing him A, B, Cs, and this is a dog, and this is a bird, and this is blue, and this is red. And so I just started from, like, square one, like I was talking naturally to a child. And with her helping and me doing what I was doing, um, he started to get his speech back. And so all of a sudden then, yes, his speech came back, and, and the garbled was gone. And But reality is that he would sometimes be right on, and sometimes he would be living in the past, like, hey, where's my brother? He said he was going to come over, and we were going to go to lunch. You know, get him on the phone for me. And, oh, his brother was dead 20 years already. So what I did is I called my brother and I said, Ed, do me a favor, call me back, pretend that you're Nick's brother, mm. and, and, and ask him about playing the saxophone, tell him you're going to take him to lunch, you're just busy at the studio, da -de -de -da. and so he did. And even though my husband's brain was somewhat damaged and all, uh, when, when he hung up from that conversation, he, he had a frown on his face. I said, well, that was so nice, I said, of uh, Red to call. And he said, you know, that didn't sound like him. And I said, oh, well, I said, you know, we're here in, in this nice little nursing home. And I said, the communication on the lines of these phones are really sometimes not right on. So I think it's the fact of the phone line coming in here. He goes, oh, okay, then that must be it. And that's how I got through that. So there was always these instances that would pop up because you never knew where his brain was and where his thinking was. And actually, after he was awake, Oh, two, three weeks, and the speech therapist was working with him and everything. And, you know, of course, I'm working with him, and I'm there every day for 10 to 15 hours a day and giving him hugs and kisses and everything. One day she looked at him and she said to him, she pointed up to me as I was standing by his bed, and she said, do you know who that is? Who is that? And I was just smiling at him, you know, and thinking, okay, everything's great. He looked at me. And he shook his head, and he said, 
no, uh, do I know you? Mm. And I said, uh, well, I, I, my heart, I thought my heart was going to yeah. just explode. Yeah. And I said, uh, my name's, my name's Gloria. I said, I'm here every day. And I said, uh, y- you'll get to know me. And then I walked out of the room and went in the hall and cried, of yeah. course. And so, but then, so when the next day when I came in, I had these signs. I made like five or six signs, and I posted them everywhere. I, I used the book name, Gabriella Loves Nick. Nick loves Gabriella. Gabriella loves Nick. Nick loves Gabriella. And every day I would say to him, I'd point to the sign on the curtain, Gabriella loves Nick. I'm Gabriella. You're Nick. Then up on the TV, I had it um, taped up there. Nick loves Gabriella. You <laughs> love me. And so this went on for, I don't know, three, four weeks or whatever. Then finally one day, he said, and I'm doing this Gabriella loves Nick thing, and he goes, you know I love you. Why do we have to have these signs everywhere telling everybody? <laughs> and then I... I I knew I got through to him, and I start laughing, and I said to him, you're right, we don't need these signs anymore, do we? I took them all down. So um, I, I got a bonus. I mean, you know, he went into the coma in July, August, late August. I bring him out of the coma, and then he's in the nursing home September, October, November. Beginning in November, I brought him home purposely, because I started to feel like he might be not safe there. That's all in the book. And I had him for Thanksgiving. I had him for Christmas. And I had him for New Year's Eve. And God was so good and then took him January 6th wow. of 2013. Wow. Where can people get a hold of the book? Uh, it's on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Very easy to do, or you can buy it right from my website, Gloria J. York. US. Gloria J. York with an E on the end. Dot US. Okay, when we come back, I want to get into some of the things that you recommend people do to avoid uh, a similar situation because I know from personal experience how. Uh, difficult it can be to uh, navigate our medical system these days, particularly when there's a serious illness involved, um, having experienced it in several times in the last few years myself. So we'll do that when we come back from the break. It's Beyond Reality Radio. By the way, our phone lines are open at 844-687-7669. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. Gloria, we've got a few people on the line that we're going to try to get to before the end of our discussion here. They wanted uh, to consult with you. I know that you offered to do some readings. Um, But before we get there, uh, the book also contains what I guess would be considered advice or recommendations for people to avoid getting into a situation where they uh, lose control of the care of themselves or a loved one, uh, as you seem to have uh, had happen to you. Uh, what are some of the things that people can do to defend themselves against that? Well, they have to be alert and um, become knowledgeable of why they what their sickness is. And the, the first thing you have to do is to choose an advocate. And you choose an advocate when you're healthy. You don't wait till you're in the hospital uh, or, or somewhere else. Uh, it's just too late. Um, and so you want to select someone, be it your spouse or family member or friend, uh, someone hopefully that might be a little younger than you because it entails when you ask someone to be your advocate, and um, you need for them to come and visit you every single day and to stay three, four, five hours. They're not there to bring magazines and eat bonbons. They're there to walk in and to really check you out. If they see you're frowning, then they, they should, that's a signal. You're either frightened about something, worried about something, or you're in pain. And they should check you for rashes. Uh, definitely check your bed linens. Have they been changed? Is your meal sitting on the side getting cold? Nobody came in to feed you, and you're not able to feed yourself. You're too weak or whatever. Definitely meet with the floor nurse that day. Find out how you slept the night before. 
uh, even though you're asking the patient, how'd you sleep? A lot of times you're going to get fine, but maybe it wasn't fine. And then definitely you want to meet face-to-face with the doctor every five days. You can find out his schedule. If they say he's going to come in at 7 in the morning, you better get there at 6. Because it, it does vary, obviously. Right. But if you can't catch up with him, then call the office and, and, and uh, find out when you can meet with him. And you, you say, I want to meet with you face-to-face. And you go over uh, what's happening. When do you think he might come home? What's our next step? Is he progressing? If they're talking operation, you ask, what could go wrong? Because uh, in my husband's case, there was one point when they said that he needed his gallbladder operated on because his stomach started to swell up in the nursing home. And so they rushed him to the hospital. They wanted to even go in and operate on him the next morning without all the tests being brought in. And I said, you know, are you people insane? We need to see the results of these tests. And then these tests, we have to discuss this with my doctor. You're not just going to come in and, and use my husband as a guinea pig. No way. Get out. Yeah. And so, of course, they left, and that was the end of that tune. Uh, then at one point they said the gallbladder was real hot. Well, you certainly don't want to operate on somebody whenever the gallbladder is hot because it's filled with infection, and you go in, it's going to burst, and all that infection is going to go through the person and kill them instantly. And so as it turned out, after we waited two, three, four days, and then again prayed, and a a priest happened to come by, and we said special prayers, and even he gave the anointing of the sick, sick, which used to be called last rites, the very next day, the doctor walks in, and he said to me, infection's gone. His his, His gallbladder is perfect now. Uh, we don't we don't know we don't know what happened here, but we're sending him back to the nursing home. He's 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 fine. There's no problem anymore. And so, in the story before we went on break, now we're ready to get into the paranormal. And oh, yeah. um, what what happened there with my husband? All of a sudden, when he's he's at the home at our house, it's January. Okay, I've never been with anyone who who was dying. I never been with anyone who died in front of me. And all of a sudden my cell phone starts to vibrate on the kitchen counter. I'm thinking it's the doctor and happy that it is because my husband is not looking right. He's looking grayish. And so I run to get it and I lift up the cell phone and I look at it and hear someone and I don't know who. I've asked all friends and family, nobody everybody says, No, no. There was a gift that I, it, it, the picture was a dark chapel, cute little dark chapel, and all of a sudden Jesus appears, and he's walking off the altar in this beautiful white robe, and he outstretches his arms and is smiling, and he's walking right towards the camera, whoever is holding that phone, and he's, his arms are outstretched, and I just took it like Jesus was coming. I dropped the phone. I ran to my husband. I'm holding him. I'm crying. I'm telling him that Jesus is coming to take him. But don't be afraid. I've got your hand, and I won't let go of it till he takes it from me. Then I took out the scapular that I had my husband and I wore. We wore for like 20 years at that point. I, of course, still wear it every single day. And we wore it every day and every night because... It's a scapular to Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and the Blessed Mother says, anyone who crosses over and is wearing my scapular will never experience the fire of hell. And so I am holding him with one arm, and I'm crying, and I grabbed the scapular, and I said to the Blessed Mother, you promised anyone who wore your scapular, and he's been wearing your scapular for many, many years, that he will not see the fires of hell. I hope that you keep your promise. I hope you keep your promise. And then, for some reason, I had the nerve to even say to her, would you let me know that you have kept your promise? Please let me know. And so my husband, of course, he passes. I mean, he's 
as the day went on, it, we're into the evening. I put an oxygen mask on him. I cover him up. You know, I'm telling him, oh, my, you need this, you need that, you know, and I'm trying to keep him warm. I sit there on the sofa watching him. It's like started like at 9 o'clock. I watched him till 3 in the morning, and he turned solid white. And he was always olive skin. He turned solid white like chalk. And finally, at 3 o'clock, it just, it was like said to me, you know, he's gone. So I got up, I turned off the, the noisy machine, oxygen machine. I looked at him, I kissed him, I cried. I said, well, I guess you're with Jesus now. So what happened was he was cremated. And I'd say a couple days after him being cremated, I woke up one morning and I sat at the edge of the bed like, like we all do, getting my thoughts together. But all of a sudden, I got so extremely tired that I actually just fell back on the bed and went into a deep sleep. And I started dreaming. And I was in a great big area that was desolate. No one was there. And then out of the distance, I saw someone running towards me. And as the person became closer and closer where I could make it out, here it was my husband. Now I cremated, had him cremated in his full tuxedo that he always wore when entertaining. And this There he was. There was my husband running towards me in his full tuxedo. And on the outside of his tuxedo was the scapular to the Blessed Mother. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, why why do you have that scapular on the outside of the tuxedo, I'm thinking. And it's crazy how my eyes just went right towards the scapular. And in his hands, he was carrying... This my favorite blue rosary, and I own like 20, 25 pairs of rosaries, different colors, different everything. And this one is my favorite. It's Our Lady of Lourdes rosary. And he had this blue rosary in his hand bouncing as he's running towards me, bouncing left and right as his hands are outstretched. And I'm looking at that scapular, and he's smiling. I mean, he's beaming. He is so happy and so healthy looking. I mean, he looks fantastic. And I'm so glad to see him. And I reach out my arms to grab him. He's like six feet from me. And all of a sudden, bam, he disappears. And I woke up crying. And I sat on the outside of the bed and I said, what the heck was that? What a dream. And then it hit me. The Blessed Mother answered my prayer. I asked her to let me know that she kept her promise. And she did by letting me see him wearing that scapular, so tremendously happy, and her rosary in his hand. And I thank her every single day for answering my prayer. And then, after a year, was he was gone, he went in January, as I said. It was an October evening the following year. And I'm under a tremendous amount of stress. I'm trying to sell our huge home. I'm getting things organized. I'm giving things away to all the different charities and trying to get myself organized and where am I going to go and all. And it was late. It was like 9, 9.30 at night, and I had washed the bed linens, and so I was making the bed. I had the lights on in the bedroom. The rest of the house was dark. As I flipped the sheets to make the bed, the sheet came down. And I'm watching the sheet come down onto the bed, and all of a sudden, 
in walking in the room, I see black slacks. And I just, like, froze. I thought, oh, my God, there's an intruder in the house. And I was almost afraid to even look at his face, but I forced myself to go up his body. And there, standing there looking at me, was my husband. And I just fell to my knees because I came within seconds of fainting. I could feel the blood rushing from my feet all the way up to my head, and I was just looking at him in shock. And he looked at me, and then he just disappeared. And that was the first time that he returned to me. Well, and if you say it's the first time, it means that it happened other times. Correct. Does it continue to happen? Yes. Is that, um, is that comforting for you? Well, it is. And when he comes to me, uh, and I have put some of this into medical manslaughter. He's given us channeled message uh, on what it's like to be in the afterlife. He's, he says he doesn't want to say everything. It, apparently, a lot of spirits have said that. That will tell you a little bit. But they don't want to spoil the surprise because it's so different for every single one that passes over. And the last time my husband came here um, was, well, it's less than a year ago. I was sleeping a deep sleep in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, I woke up. And there he stood, kind of at the doorway of the bedroom. And he was turning back and looking at me. And mentally, he said to me, It's time for me to move on, and it's time for you to move on also. And I just stared at him. I said, I'm not ready. And he said, yes, it's time. And he took a step, and he disappeared. So that was the last time he was here, and like I say, that was little less than a year ago. And as time now has gone on throughout this year, I'm able to release more and more of his things that I have been holding on to. And it's just the way I am. Everyone reacts differently to death. Some people immediately empty the closets within the next week or whatever. And though I have given away 15 of his suits and probably 50 of his ties, I still have some more here because he obviously was a a very good dresser and and had quite a bit. So uh, there's the last few remaining things that um, uh, I naturally will be given away to family members or charity or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it's... It's time. Gloria, we're, we're out of time here. Um, thank you so much for sharing what is obviously a very emotional and in, in many ways heartbreaking, but also in some ways uplifting story with us. Um, and you share it in your book as well. And I think you teach some very, very valuable lessons in the book. And I was hoping I'd have time to share some of my personal experiences because uh, I had some uh, some of the same difficulties with the medical system with uh, some illness in my family. And um, I, I can feel that pain with you. And I'm sure there are many, many people that can feel that pain. So once again, let folks know where they can get a hold of the book. And uh, you have a website. Um, I'm not, and I know you're a medium. Do you do readings for people? Is that part of what you do? Or I do. Yeah. I do. Is there a way I to do. contact I, I, you? I do the spiritual channeling, and whenever necessary, um, I utilize the tarot reading uh, and let spirits come through that also. But uh, most definitely, yes. And and people can get a hold of you for that uh, on your website. 
Uh, they can. They can email me, and that's listed in the book. And Gloria it's in Gloria J. York, Y O R K E dot U S. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, you said the book is on Amazon. We also have a link to it on uh, the Beyond Reality Radio uh, social media and uh, the YouTube uh, stream that's playing right now. So, again, thank you so much for being here, Gloria. We appreciate your time. You're welcome. And perhaps we can talk again and maybe talk more about the the paranormal yeah. and the metaphysical. Yeah, I would very much like that because we just simply ran out of time tonight. Um, and I'm sad that we that happened, but we can certainly have you back. That would be that would be time well spent. Okay. Thank you very much, JV. God bless. All right. Thank you, and God bless you. Uh, again, the book is called Medical Manslaughter: Will Your Doctor Cause Your Death? Gloria's website is her name. Gloria J. York. There's an E on the end of York.us. You can get more information about her work there. Okay, we got to take a quick break. Come back and wrap things up in just a moment. It's Beyond Reality Radio. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Johaw. That's J-O-H-A-W. Welcome back to the show. Thank you to both John Hogue and Gloria York uh, for their participation in tonight's program. Great conversations, both of them. I, and we needed the full two hours for both of them. We just didn't have that opportunity trying to fit it all in. And sorry for the folks that were on hold trying to get a reading or, or add a comment to our discussion. We just simply ran out of time tonight. But we will have Gloria back at some point. Promise that will happen. Don't forget, tomorrow night, John Barber will be here to talk about the Garrison tapes, never seen before released documents provided by James Garrison about the JFK assassination. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.